Another sneak peek at HoloLens. Microsoft has a new browser called Edge, and tattooed ladies have trouble with the Apple Watch. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 327 for Wednesday, April 29th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox, but with IT admin tools that allow you to control and protect your company information. Visit dropbox.com slash business for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash business. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we talk about the tech headlines and talk to the people behind the headlines. After the break, we will cover everything you need to know about today's Microsoft Build Conference in San Francisco. But first, please welcome Apple analyst Renee Ritchie, editor-in-chief of iMore and host of Twit's Mac, Mac Break Weekly. Welcome, Renee. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. So you got your Apple Watch. Can we see it? I, yeah, it's the stainless steel with the Milanese band, which I quite like. But that's your loaner. That, that's not yes. the one that you picked out. No, I ordered the black stainless steel, but those are only shipping in mid-May, so I've got my patience cap on. And, and as you were saying before, you ordered several extra bands for it. Correct? I did. I ordered a sport one to work out with, and I ordered a leather one because I thought that would be nice and casual. And the loops are sort of like uh, sort of like the stretch pants of bands, I feel. Like you can <laughs> adjust them throughout the day. They're like Lululemon for your wrist. <laughs> do they see through like the Lululemon pants? I, I don't know. I have to do some testing. <laughs> well, I heard you on your uh, your your podcast, I'm More, you were talking about how you only have you to spend money on. So why not, right? Yeah, I mean that's kind of sad, but true. I don't, I don't have kids. I'm, I'm not married right now, and I have very little expenses, so I just waste my money on technology. Right. Well, or I did, invest it maybe. I did see on your Instagram you had some kids that were that were you were taking them to try on. They they were some loner kids you had that were trying. My on god kids. Yeah, I have a terrific little god kid, six years old and nine years old, and they keep me rooted in reality. Right. Yes. Well, do not buy them an Apple Watch. No kids should get an Apple Watch. No, because they they don't even have iPhones. So they wouldn't be able to use them. Right. True. That, that's the yeah. only, that's, that's the best reason. <laughs> so what do you love about your watch so far? Uh, I like, so but when Apple first announced it, a light bulb went off in my head and said, oh my gosh, this is going to be so convenient. And I, um, the analogy I use is my father got an Apple II Plus when I was a really little kid and it let him do things like VisiCalc at home so he didn't have to drive all the way downtown and go to IBM and use the mainframes. And then when I got my iPhone, I didn't have to go running back to my Mac. If you emailed me while I was out, I would still get that email so I didn't have to be chained to my Mac anymore. And now as silly as it sounds, the Apple Watch, because it's so good at notifications and remote controls and a bunch of other very brief brief but very important tasks, I don't have to even reach into my pocket or my bag or go across the room to where it's charging and go to my iPhone anymore. There's like this subset of things that it just handles really, really well. So does it handle things as well as you expected or even better or just about the same? It it does. So I, I, I wasn't really sure. It does some things better than I thought it would. It does some things. I mean, it's definitely a first generation product. It doesn't have real apps yet. It has these um, watch kit extensions that still run off your phone, almost like the first iPhone had web apps instead of native apps. So there's there's these little bottlenecks that you find sometimes. And I'm still get you like I forget to use the digital crown because I'm so used to, you know, tracing my finger across glass on the iPhone. But I've had it for about a week now and we're starting to maybe form a better relationship together. <laughs> You're working on it. It might be someone you want to spend more time with. Uh, well, I definitely want to spend more time with it. I'm curious to see where it goes from here. Great. So what are the, some things that you don't like about it so far? So the, the thing that I don't like is harder to, to, for me to quantify because part of it is me adjusting to it and it adjusting to me. Like right away, I turned off a lot of the notifications. I turned off the sounds. Um, I, the model for launching stuff with Siri is great, but if I'm in a situation where I can't use Siri because it would be awkward or impolite or something, I, I still have to hunt around sometimes to find apps. Uh, and a lot of developers made apps before they had the actual watch hardware, so not all the apps are really optimized for that that quick experience because you only really have seconds when you're using a watch. And I'm not sure they really thought through the interactivity model, but I'm hoping that will get better as they play with their actual watches. Right. Well, I ordered the 32 millimeter space gray with a black sport band, which apparently everyone else also yes. in the world ordered. Uh, so is my ship date, is the one I'm seeing, is that, is that, do you think that's accurate? 
Uh, so it is and it isn't. I never want to get anyone's hopes up and build up a bunch of expectational debt by saying it'll come early. But we have seen examples of Apple fulfilling these orders just as fast as they can. And the black one is, it gets all, black is always the most popular. Any accessory or fashion person will tell you, like the little black dress or little black shirt, it just it goes with everything. So everyone always defaults to ordering it. Right. So Serenity, your coworker over at iMore, posted a piece yesterday about how the Apple Watch heart rate sensor doesn't work if you have dark wrist tattoos. And what's going on there? All right, so Apple put up an article that actually explains how it works last week, and it uses a photo sensor. So it, it uses two things. It has infrared light detectors, and that tries to get like a really quick reading. And if it can't, it fires off a green LED, and it relies on how your skin uh, absorbs green light to get an accurate reading. So if you have any sort of interference, if you have, you know, at the large end, a bandage over your skin or a shirt or something over your skin, it's impenetrable. And then if you have scar tissue or you have really dark, really large tattoos, anything that prevents that light light from, from getting through your skin is going to cause a problem with the heart rate sensor. That's interesting. The article has been picked up in a lot of places. I wonder if they will adjust it in the next version. It's you know, They'll have to do other, th I mean, it's the current limits of this kind of technology, any sensor that uses this kind of technology. If it's strictly for athletics, you can pair the, the Apple Watch with a heart rate sensor that you wear around your chest. I think Polar makes a really popular one. Uh, for security, uh, you, you might have to decide that you don't want it to automatically lock when you lose skin contact and you don't want to trust your Apple Pay credit cards to it. Or maybe just try it on a wrist that doesn't have all those tattoos on if you're comfortable. <laughs> so are you an exerciser? Have you used it for running or sports yet? I have. I used it for hiking. The day, the two days after I got it, uh, I was still in on, on the West Coast. So we, we did a long hike across the Pacific Ocean, which was quite wonderful. And did you feel that it was accurate? Yeah. So they recommend that you use it with your iPhone for at least a couple times because then it uses the iPhone's GPS to sort of sanity check all the modeling they did in the labs and adjust it to your personal gait and stride and, and pace and all these things. And after that, it seems to be really accurate. Uh, there's still certain things like it tries to do exercise equipment. We're not sure how it handles different resistance levels yet. But for all the basic stuff, it seems to they seem to have done enough testing to make sure that it's at least in the ballpark. So let's move on to on Monday, Apple released earnings. This was their strongest March quarter yet. They had 27 percent revenue growth, 40 percent earnings per share growth year over year. The iPhone is still the majority of their business at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, the iPhone is ludicrously successful. It's more successful than people who have oligopoly control over fossil fuel resources. <laughs> there's just there's no other business like it. And it kind of skews everything else when you when you look at it through that lens. So so what role is China playing this quarter for Apple? China is a massive growth sector uh, for Apple. I don't believe it. It's hard to actually measure because you have such a vibrant um, upper class there and a growing middle class. And some people say, well, you know, there's a disparity between the classes, but you just have so many people that even if the percentage wise, it seems small, it's still a massive amount of people. And they're very interested, just culturally very interested, especially in electronics and things that they believe have a certain cachet and Apple exists in both those areas. So the only disappointment was the iPad sales. And I mean, they still sold a lot of iPads. But on uh, MacBreak Weekly yesterday, Andy compared the iPad to the Google Loon balloons. It's saying that it was <laughs> something Apple would keep creating, even if they never make any more money out of them. Do you agree with that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't know how much money the Loon balloons made, but the, the iPad is making millions and millions and billions of dollars. Any company, Microsoft would kill for that business. Google would kill for that business. A standalone company would love to have Apple's problem with the iPad. It's making ungodly amounts of money. It's just, uh, it accelerated so quickly. It, it grew faster than the iPhone did, which means that it hit the, the the speed limit for how many people would need one or need to upgrade one at any given time. So the, the, the acceleration has stopped, but the amount of money they're generating on it is down, but still incredibly significant for them. Well, there was an interesting article on Recode today about how part of the trouble with the iPad is that they're competing with other tablets that mobile carriers are giving away. I mean, that's what happened at our house. We have an iPad Air 2 and a Galaxy Note tablet that Sprint just gave us. They said, here, have this. Of course, they charge us $10 a month for it. But the iPad is a better product, in my opinion. But when you consider its cost versus free, things start to look a little different. I mean, do you think that really is a problem for the iPads? Huh. I think maybe I'm not I'm not really sold that, that that many people will they'll get a free product but I'm not sure how much they end up using it. I think the the bigger problems for Apple right now and again these are great problems to have is that the bigger iPhones uh, make people maybe get a large iPhone six plus instead of a small iPad mini. The lighter Macs like the MacBook uh, now is almost like an iPad with a split open uh, keyboard. So people might be getting MacBook Airs or might be getting MacBooks instead of getting iPads on the top end. So the iPad is sort of really squashed in between. But Apple is still investing heavily in the iPad 
And based on rumors alone, they got a lot of interesting stuff coming up. And especially when you look at what they're doing with chipsets and with Force Touch, you sort of get this idea that that product is going to have a, um, some really good times ahead of it. Right, so no Google loon balloons for... <laughs> Google, I, if Google's making this much money off loon balloons, more power to them. <laughs> right. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Microsoft Build Conference after the break, but I wanted to get your take on their announcements today about the iOS apps on Windows 10. They said that uh, Windows 10 will ship with APIs that mirror the expected behavior of many iOS APIs, so you can run iOS apps on Windows devices, including on the desktop. What do you think this means for Apple? So I'm, I'm perpetually optimistic about these kinds of stuff, but I have to sort of weigh that against always being disappointed. I mean, BlackBerry's tried to emulate Android apps and uh, Windows probably going to emulate. It's, just, it, it's always this idea of build once, run everywhere, and it just never works the way that we thought it would. And for example, here, yes, you might be able to more easily port your app, but you're still going to have to support the app for those customers. And at the end of the day, you still got to make money off that app. And Microsoft has to demonstrate to developers that regardless of how easy it is to move those apps over to the Windows platform, they're going to make enough money to warrant their time and effort and split of attention to do that. Right. Well, Renee, thank you so much for joining us. Renee Ritchie is the editor in chief of iMore. You can follow him on Twitter at Renee Ritchie, um, and you can check out all of his work and all of his great writers at iMore. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Take care. You too. Coming up, why one startup is giving $35 million back to investors and how one retiree fought back against a $24,000 bill from AT&T for dial-up. But first, many of you use Dropbox. We do too. And at Twit, we use it to sync and share files, everything from sharing audio MP3s, large graphic files, to invoices and program schedules. We used to use our personal Dropbox accounts until we discovered Dropbox for Business. It's a better way to manage accounts, manage billing, and have visibility and control over your data. Plus, the same old Dropbox interface that you and your employees already know and love. Simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform and any device. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with one terabyte, and it's very easy to expand. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors. And most importantly, for IT professionals, you have control. Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing, and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure only the right people get access to sensitive company data. Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security and administration solutions such as SIM, Security Information and Event Management, DLP, and eDiscovery for even more control. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing. Extra security features are available like single sign-on and two-step verification. If you want to give it a try, take advantage of your employees' familiarity with Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash business for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash business. Now let's get to the tech feed. The Microsoft Build Developers Conference began today in San Francisco. Here's a roundup of what we learned. Visual Studio Code, that's the name of the new cross-platform code editor for Windows OS X and Linux. This is the first cross-platform version of Visual Studio ever. The company also announced that Windows 10 will be able to run reworked iOS and Android apps, as we mentioned before. And the much-hyped HoloLens also made an appearance. HoloLens is the augmented reality platform Microsoft announced in January. Today, developers and journalists at Build got to see Windows 10 Universal apps in holograms, and they were promised that they would soon be able to develop for HoloLens, but no word yet on when the augmented reality headset will ship. Microsoft also unveiled its new web browser that will debut in Windows 10. The stripped-down browser will replace Internet Explorer and will officially be called Microsoft Edge. One big announcement that was missing today was a release date for Windows 10. They've promised the summer, and some leaked information leads us to believe that that release will be in July, but there's still no official word. David Bittau, co-founder of the anonymous social app Secret, announced that he would soon be shutting down the service. Secret launched in February of last year. It was one of the first apps where people could anonymously post their thoughts. Bittau says he created the app to promote open creative expression, but that the double-edged sword of anonymity has turned his venture into something that no longer rep represents his original vision. It's good to know that his original vision did not include creating a better, prettier, more efficient way for people to cyberbully each other. TechCrunch reports that the company will give back the $35 million that they raised. 
Today's Instagram announced their first vertical content channel at Music to showcase popular and emerging artists around the globe. According to a blog post, the channel will show you a different side of the musical artists you already know and love. This is the first Instagram account dedicated to a particular topic, although it isn't the only internally operated channel on Instagram. At Instagram is dedicated to showing interesting and positive ways people use the service. In other words, not your bathroom selfies. And finally, you think your bills for internet access are high? Meet Ron Dorf, an 83-year-old California resident who just got a bill from AT&T for $24,000. That's a lot of high-speed internet access, except the fact that Dorf was accessing the internet through his AOL dial-up subscription. According to the LA Times Consumer Reporter, the man tried to contact AT&T to find out why his bill was so high. And although they sent out a technician twice, they said that Dorf was on the hook for the 24 grand. But of course, when the LA Times called AT&T on Dorf's behalf, they changed their tune pretty quickly. Apparently, Dorf's modem was dialing a long distance number and would remain connected, tracking up, racking up the high bill. The LA Times was able to convince AT&T to waive the fee. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.